There we go. So, uh, good morning, everybody. It's great to be here at Conspiracy Camp, uh, where, we, where we get to crowdsource birth certificates, possibly death certificates, uh, what really happened at Roswell. Uh, what I'm going to do this morning, actually, is um, instead of giving sort of a report on Code for America, which the Sunlight Foundation um, has uh, been a generous uh, and a critical supporter of, I'm actually going to look forward to the next big project for Code for America and for Open Plans, uh, which we are just uh, sort of getting off the ground right now, uh, called Civic Commons. So um, Civic Commons is uh, going to attempt to be a kind of a, um, uh, a, a Mozilla Foundation or an Apache Foundation uh, for civic technology, in other words, a gardener of open source software and projects for uh, cities and municipalities that are delivering public services and trying to achieve transparency. So the basic story, the basic rationale here is that uh, different cities across the country and across the world have got to face the same common problems. They've got to, uh, uh, with some variation, deliver the same kinds of public services, the same kinds of data and information um, to their citizens. And so it's uh, pretty silly, inefficient, and wasteful for each city to be uh, building uh, its own solutions to those problems independently, or worse yet, to be procuring its own solutions uh, from rapacious vendors who deliver costly and uh, rapidly useless technology where they could be contributing to common code stacks and common solutions that everyone can benefit from and can live uh, together. So the idea here is cities with, uh, have the same problems. Uh, they ought to be linking together uh, at a political level, at a cultural level, at a technical level uh, to be able to share this kind of uh, approach. Um, of course, this is already happening. There's lots of open source kinds of collaborative uh, enterprises that are happening. Uh, uh, the uh, Venn diagram overlap between public sharing and software is the oh my god moment that we're aiming for, not the lovers in public sharing PDA moment. that many of us are hoping to avoid. So the idea then is a platform for open cities. Civic Commons is a nonprofit organization. It's currently a, a project of Code for America, open plans, and uh, uh, a number of governmental partners that have helped us get off the ground. What we aim to do is work with cities, help them connect up with the technologies that are out there and already available, uh, work with information resources on things like licensing, contracting terms, how do city lawyers uh, get through the process of open sourcing code that they've been working on. Um, and then, of course, um, linking up with all of the various support organizations that are already out there doing interesting work in technology. Um, we've got a number of current projects that are already underway. Before I dive into that, let me just say, there are two really critical arguments that we found have to be sort of established so that people understand uh, what is possible. First of all, it's, uh, open source is not communism. It's not philanthropy. It's not something that you do because it feels good. It's something that you do because it's in your naked, rational, Ayn Randian self-interest. And that is to say that open source programming is when a city has, let's say, three individuals. Uh, if you can contribute them into a well-structured project, you can benefit from the three individuals in 10 other cities, and you get a collective pool of 33 individuals uh, that are building a piece of software that everybody gets to benefit from. This is the basic argument of open source. You put in your 10%, other people put in their 90%, you benefit from their patches and updates and features and modules, and everybody is better off. So we've already got a set of uh, projects underway. We're building a catalog uh, for the Civic Stack. The idea that we have here is a kind of a crunch base of rapidly evolving information about what's out there, who are the vendors, who are the implementers, um, what are the, where's the documentation, where are the help forums, um, who are the experts. And uh, uh, if, if you're a big tech nerd, you might have seen Crunchbase, which basically uses Wikipedia software to build that out for startups and investors. And we have the idea that something like this would be very useful to people in the civic space. Um, we're going to try to produce an open marketplace. Um, and a lot of this is basic argumentation about uh, techniques and, um, uh, and culture, which is how do you um, uh, uh, persuade a city management, for example, to open source? Or if you are a mayor, how do you get your technical people to go out and understand how they can take advantage of these unbelievably dramatic changes in the cost and availability of technologies that we all benefit from um, uh, every day? Uh, we've just taken the uh, federal IT dashboard, so you may have seen the announcement. Um, Vivek Kundra and his team uh, open sourced it and handed it over to Civic Commons to be the sort of uh, gardener of. So the IT dashboard is a code package for uh, tracking IT projects within government. And um, it's uh, now going to be an open source, well-documented, and hopefully um, ever-evolving uh, platform 
for cities to make transparent uh, where they're spending their money on tech projects and how they can improve uh, their uh, performance. Um, we've got uh, San Francisco's enterprise addressing system. This sounds kind of boring, but every city needs to have a baseline uh, database for uh, addresses um, that can power um, uh, a vast range of city applications. Um, there's also the federal register, uh, so the idea that uh, the code that um, uh, enables um, a government to put its code and rules and regulations and so forth online, that ought to be open source. So anybody with uh, anything from a fire code to uh, a city code uh, to uh, a state code ought to be able to very cheaply and easily make it available with great functionality. And the one that I'm most excited about is Open 311, which is uh, pioneered by New York, but also San Francisco, uh, Boston, and DC have been participating in helping us get it ready to be open sourced. And this is basically the back end system that allows you to place a phone call, send an email, send a text message, send an, uh, a cell phone photograph to a city uh, with open APIs on the front end. Uh, outbound standardized data feeds on the uh, far end, and in between a system for ticketing each pothole report or request for information that comes in, making it available on maps, giving the mayors a dashboard so they can see performance of agencies, how quickly they respond, who's responsible, and doing it all very transparently. This is something that any city around the world ought to be able to take advantage of. Growing village of participants. Finally, there's, of course, the international angle here. There are many, many cities across the world with similar and common problems. We are very much hoping that we can go international quickly. How to get involved? CivicCommons.org, uh, or .com, I guess, but CivicCommons.org. We have a uh, uh, launch probably in about the next week or two of a new and updated website with lots of opportunities for you to get involved. And that is the update on Civic Commons from Code for America. Thank you. Thank you. Up next. We have Michael Morrissey, who's joining us from Massachusetts. And his tool is something called Muckrock, which I will let him tell you more about, but essentially works with freedom of information laws on a state and local levels. Hi, I'm uh, good morning. I'm Michael Morrissey. Uh, I'm the co-founder of muckrock.com, um, which is a very, very, very easy way to file freedom of information requests. Um, has anybody in the room ever filed a freedom of information request? OK, a couple people. Now keep your hand raised if that was a really great experience and it worked out well for you. And so there's a few hands raised, which is great. But um, if you've done many federal requests or particularly local requests, a lot of times um, you don't know which agency to file to. You don't know how to write a letter. Um, you submit your letter and you wait a few weeks and you submit another letter and you wait a few more weeks and you'll never ever get a response. Um, so what we've done is we've tried to bring this process into the 21st century by all you do is you come to this website, sign up for an account, type in which documents you're interested in, and then we draft a letter based on where you are, what you want, and submit it to the proper agency. And we actually will keep, follow, uh, keep following up until you get it answered. Um, and because it's all sort of computer driven, you don't have to remember these deadlines, you don't have to know the law. We sort of um, you know, have that all built in for you. Um, and so while we've been developing this site, uh, which is funded very generously from a grant from the, uh, the Sunlight Foundation, as well as users like you, um, we've come across three sort of rules that we sort of take into account that sort of guide everything we do. And the first rule is avoid work at all costs, which was the last slide. And um, you know, so there's people sort of joke that hard work pays off in the future, and uh, as this cat is enjoying, laziness pays off now. But um, one of the things we've found is that hard work right now a lot of times means hard work in the future if you work hard on the wrong things. Um, so because once you've built these features, you kind of have to support them forever and ever and ever. Um, and so what we really tried to do is we had all these great ideas. We we're going to have integrated databases so you could easily search through your data and all these other great ideas about what we wanted the site to be. Um, but when we first launched the site, it was really just this empty sort of form where you just type in stuff. And um, then I would actually go and manually email that form off. And I would, you know, it was a very manual process. But um, based on that sort of feedback, we were able to develop a, uh, a more sophisticated wizard, you know, but we didn't build anything until we knew A, people were going to use it, and B, more importantly, how they were going to use it and what features they wanted. Um, but the interesting thing to note is that even though we built this fancy form that our users really liked, that sort of says, OK, this is how you request mug shots or a bunch of other different common FOIA requests. 90% of our users still use um, just that original blank form. So uh, simpler is good. Um, the other thing sort of on the laziness, uh, last thing on the laziness note, is we use a lot of free software. Um, these are three of the really important projects. Document Cloud is a nice open source document viewer. Django, uh, anybody familiar with Django here? 
to help people. It's a great framework to really quickly get something up and running and not have to worry about a lot of the basic things. And uh, Spotus helps funds us. It's a crowdfunding, open source crowdfunding platform. Um, early on, we were approached by Script, which does um, document embedding. And um, they said, hey, you know, instead of using this open source software, use this R closed proprietary thing because we have better features and we're, you know, better known. Um, but we actually decided not to use that. And kind of the warning when you're using free software is pay really close attention to are you going to control that data at the end of the day? Because like Scribd um, said, you know, like Scribd did a few years back, all of a sudden they decided old documents should belong beyond a paywall. And if that happens to you, you don't have any real uh, recourse. Um, so our second sort of rule is think small. Um, we had a lot of great ideas at the beginning, but we kept saying, okay, what's the very minimal amount of thing that people will use and enjoy? Um, because we really wanted to avoid a uh, feature creep with all the, uh, the software. So we have sort of a do less, do less stuff well mantra um, because it's easier to build. You have to put less resources in in the beginning, and then it's a lot easier to maintain down the way, and um, it's a lot easier to use for the end user. Um, you know, just look at Google versus Yahoo and see uh, see who's doing better these days. Um, and so we really sort of said, what's the very basic tool that we can build that people will use? And a lot of times it's not only easy for you, but it's easier for uh, your end users. Um, but just because a tool is simple, kind of like the Google Yahoo example, uh, doesn't mean it's not powerful. Because we based everything on FOIA, we've um, really been able to help uh, our users report, self-report on a lot of uh, a variety of stories from political violence to um, uh, you go back to the slide? Okay. Yeah, so uh, everything from like national stories about political violence so you could actually see, um, you know, what was causing like, uh, you know, death threats to politicians to things very granular like parking ticket appeals in your city um, and the most popular dog names in your town, which is one of my favorite requests. Um, and then our third and sort of final internal rule that kind of guides is uh, play favorites in terms of um, don't try to please everybody. Um, a lot of sites right now try and get the widest possible clicks and, and really get out there in front of everybody. Um, but we kind of took the opposite approach is that we want a very narrow set of users who really cared about this stuff. Um, I we really, really love our customers. I'll actually like write them little notes that I have to delete because I realize I'm being creepy for thanking them for using our service. Um, but it's finding that right core, the sort of core user base early on is so important. So if you're ever building a civic project, I wouldn't think, how can we have the widest impact? I would think, how can we be useful to the people that we, you know, the people who are interested in the is issue we're building this tool around? Um, so we decided we want people who, you know, want to know more than other people about their city. Or we want people who are reporters and are looking for an easier way to get things done. And by focusing on a very narrow set of users, those users have gotten really passionate about our service. And we've done almost zero marketing. But we constantly get people said, hey, I was working on a freedom information request and somebody else who does this said you should use Muckrock. Um, and then also by sort of by sort of having a very user-centric approach, we are a subscription site, so we don't have any advertising on our site, which I think makes us forces us to sort of pay attention. What is best for the user? Um, and when you do advertising, um, you end up having pages like that last one where it's kind of 90% ads and like 2% text. Um, and so if you're starting up a news site, particularly, or any sort of project, I would sort of sort of try and tie your, uh, your goals really closely into your users' goals. Um, these are just some stats. Uh, we've helped file, our users file 452 requests, um, completed 80 of them, which is you know, a small number. But uh, if you've ever done FOIA, a lot of times it can take years to get an answer. And because it's all computers, they never sleep. And they keep pestering the federal agencies until we get those answered. Um, and then we've published uh, almost 9,000, well, getting towards 9,000 uh, pages. And we've helped do a, um, f a four dozen news articles based on documents that people have got from Muckrock um, on issues, everything from illegal immigration to like earlier food stamps and other stuff. So thanks uh, for listening and your time. I'm going to ask Robin Parkinson to come up from the National Institute for Money in Politics. And she works on campaign spending in state level elections. So for those of you who aren't familiar with us, we're the National Institute on Money in State Politics, better known as Follow the Money. And we collect state level campaign finance information for all 50 states. We do this by collecting the data from the disclosure agencies themselves. And we make it accessible to the public and advocates and anybody who wants to view this information. 
Now, we only do this at the state level. A lot of times people will ask us, well, do you have information on Barack Obama or do you have my U.S. State Center? No, we don't. That is Open Secrets, which is another great organization. Mm -hmm. If you want state level, come to us. And the reason that we only do state level is because that still means we're collecting over 100,000 reports every election cycle. And we have to work with 50 different sets of rules for these reports. So they come to us in all kinds of different formats. We take electronic databases, PDF files, paper files, and we combine them all together um, in order to create our database. And a lot of that means we have to enter it manually and then check all of that to make sure that we entered it correctly. Um, and the end result is that we end up with something that states themselves don't have, which is everything in one place. Now you can download all of our data for free. You can sign up for My Follow the Money on our website and download different charts, or you can go to transparencydata.com and get a bulk download of our data. Uh, we also provide APIs which you can use or we have widgets if you're not as technically minded so you can just take the code that we already have and copy it onto your website. Now, you might be wondering why would you want to download our data? What can you do with it? Um, and we have all kinds of different tools that we've already provided for our website. Um, we're hoping to possibly do another session today to go over a lot of these tools, but I'd like to go over a few of them quickly with you. Um, one of the ones we have that's one of our most basic tools is, um, I guess I'm going to myself here. <laughs> uh, one of our tools is uh, the My District tool. Uh, it lets you enter your home address or any other address you might want to enter into the site. Um, and you can see a list of candidates in your district, and you can see the, ca the campaign finance that they've raised so far, and you can see who's competing against them. And then you can also click on their names and delve even deeper into that individual person. Uh, we also have the LCAT tool, which we combine our API with Project Vote Smarts APIs, and we compile lists of all of the committee members at in the state level. And you can look at, say, the agriculture committee and what agriculture industry has given to that committee. And then we have our industry influence tool, which allows you to look at different industries, see what they've given over time, and look at which parties that they've given to. Um, and we also do reports, um, for those of you who don't like technical information at all. Um, and our reports are based on news of the day. Uh, we'll keep track of what's going on in the news and look at major players and show you what the campaign finance is going into what's happening in the news. So you can kind of match up and see if there's any influence that might be happening there. Um, and our data is verifiable which is why journalists around the country rely on our data. Uh, we've been in all kinds of national major newspapers, and we've been reviewed by academics who study electoral processes. <coughs> and Michael Malbin at the Campaign Finance Institute has also checked our numbers. And when they first did that, they came back to us and they said we were within 5 or 6% error. And we looked at that and we're like, well, did you take into account loan returns and repayments and all that? And they're like, oh, no. And they came back and said we were within 1% or 2%, which is really, really good. Um, and we've been cited in three U.S. Supreme Court cases, including Citizens United. Um, so I'd like to thank Sunlight Foundation and everybody else who has supported us. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. And you can always call or email me as well. Thank you. Up next is David Moore, who is going to talk to us about opengovernment.org. As soon as I make it full screen. All right, ready? Hey, everyone. How's it going? I'm David. I'm with PPF, and we're a nonprofit organization that makes uh, free and open source software for civic engagement. And I'm here to present opengovernment.org, which is a project that launched in January as a joint partnership with the Sunlight Foundation. And it's a web application that uh, brings government transparency to the state and local levels. So here, actually, can I drive? Cool. Totally good. Um, 
Uh, the major problem uh, that, that we seek to address is to make uh, legislative information more accessible to the public at large. So in 2007, with the Sunlight Foundation, uh, we launched OpenCongress.org, which scrapes Thomas and then represents it, uh, the data in a more user-friendly way. It's a tool that's used by political bloggers and activists to track and understand what's going on with Congress, and it's become the most visited not-for-profit government transparency site in the country. It's free and open source. <laughs> So as we've seen recently with the, the tremendous uh, uh, events around the Wisconsin budget reform process, there's a, there's a huge, there's a voracious public demand for in, this information at the state and local levels. Ever since we launched Open Congress as a free and open source public resource, it's been possible to remix the code and bring it down to the state and local levels. But now this process is easier than ever with opengovernment.org. So as I mentioned, it launched, in, it launched in January. And what we do is we work with Sunlight Foundation's Open States Project, which is a terrific community-driven and open source project to scrape and standardize state legislative data. So we take all the bills and um, members of state <coughs> legislatures that Open States makes available, and then we wrap it up with other data sources and put it out in, this, in this, uh, this Ruby on Rails web application that can be remixed for other geographical accounts. So I'll mention that in a little bit more soon. So what we do, uh, our, what, what we provide that's a value is uh, we bring together the official government information with news and blog coverage, with campaign contribution information, because uh, politics is rife with systemic corruption, <laughs> and also interest group analysis and, uh, and other features to track and share what's really going on. So you can see, if you take a, a sample bill page, this is, a, this, is a, this is actually a web page from 2011. This is today. This is current. Um, and there's a, there's a series of grotesque outdated user unfriendly screenshots that I could pull up because uh, state legislatures need a lot of help with their web standards. Um, so this is, this is an actual uh, screenshot today. And what we've done is we've redesigned it uh, with uh, more social sharing tools, the ability for people to comment on legislation and to track it in meaningful ways and then share it with their online communities. So it's used by political bloggers and journalists, uh, citizen watchdogs, because we're really bringing government transparency to the most local possible level. And, and it's a, a tool for activists. That's really, where we, that's really what we do. So uh, I, uh, I'm going to do a, a quick live demo, but please holler at us. Uh, that's myself and Carl, who's our director of technology, uh, who wrote uh, much, much of open government. And I'll, I'll stress again that open government can be remixed consistent with our open source license. So uh, for other, uh, if you have a, a project that could use a front end, um, to present government data. All of our visualizations are, can be remixed. And if you're from another country that's looking for, uh, uh, that's looking for code to use, uh, you can use that. And where did the, okay. So here real quick, I'll just, I'll just show the open government homepage. We currently have data for five state legislatures and we'll be announcing more soon, surfing along with uh, Sunlight and the work of Open States Project. Uh, a sample uh, state homepage looks like this, where you can see we have uh, information for bills, people, issues, and campaign contributions. Uh, so here's what some of the, uh, the member uh, profiles look like. Here's the campaign contribution information, which is, of course, important. <clears throat> and then from, a, from an individual bill page now, we provide a, a unique user experience where entering uh, a zip code uh, for that state, you can uh, immediately see who your state legislators are and write them directly from that page. So just as Open Congress is a tool for deliberative democracy and, and, and a, like, a, a consti like a constituent feedback loop with your elected officials, so is open government bringing that down to the state and soon to the local levels. Uh, also, we have RSS feeds and uh, we have a free open API for both open Congress and open government. Uh, the last thing I'd like to show you is some new features that we're developing in uh, free and open source uh, Ruby on Rails code. So this, this, this uh, feature is not yet live, so this is an early, <laughs> an early demo. Uh, everyone, please put on the hard hats that have been provided to you. They're, they're under your seats. Um, yes, it is. This is. It's definitely Oprah. So um, coming soon on Open Congress and Open Government on bill pages, um, you'll be able to click the button to write your members, and if you're logged in with a free My Open Congress account, uh, you'll be writing about uh, any other sample bill. You'll be able to click a button. Uh, that indicates whether or not you support or oppose it or are simply tracking it. And you'll be brought to a, a message builder where you'll be able to uh, write your members with just select which ones you want to write, set the privacy options, set your, um, your, uh, your, your contact information. And then importantly, uh, using this unique message builder, you'll be able to bring over information from that's aggregated uniquely on Open Congress directly into your communication with one click. So if you're writing all three of your federal uh, elected officials about a bill, you'll be able to bring over campaign contribution by clicking on, so I'm, you know, I live in New York, I'll say to Senator Schumer, with one click I can bring over on this bill, I know this is from $99,050 from insurance companies who support HR2. In addition, 
in addition to all the campaign contribution information, you'll be able to uh, bring over highly rated news and blog articles by uh, our user community, and also comments. Um, so the, uh, this process will then all be made available, all the data that will be generated by the users in this process will be made available to the public commons via free uh, API, and then people will be able to share their communication here from, uh, from a, a, a permalink. So what we're enabling groups and individuals to do is to, is to, is to um, more, in a, in a free and open way, uh, contact their members through an automated process that blasts through the congressional web forms. So, am I done? All right, thanks. I'm also going to welcome up Erica Fowler, who's with the Wesleyan Media Project. Uh, it's challenging for a, a professor to be asked to limit her comments to five minutes. So we'll turn the tables and you can tell me afterwards how well I did, but try to stick to the timeline. In any case, thanks so much for the opportunity to talk to you here today about the Wesleyan Media Project. We have been live since September of 2010, so just uh, well under a year here. And we track all political advertisements aired on television in real time during the election and provide that information uh, to the public. So as most of you, I'm sure, are aware, Citizens United fundamentally reshaped the campaign finance landscape and specifically made it, a bit, made it possible for corporations and unions to spend unlimited amounts of money on television advertising throughout the fall campaign um, and therefore uh, increased very uh, serious concerns about the amount of money that would be injected into our campaign system on behalf of special interest and therefore tipping the tables away from the average citizen. Very importantly, though, tracking systems of, of this uh, uh, advertising are very incomplete and therefore anyone with lots and lots of money can purchase this data but there was no there were no plans to make it publicly available which is where our consortium of institutions come in we're very very grateful to both the Knight Foundation and the Sunlight Foundation and especially the Sunlight Foundation's early contribution made it possible for us to say yes we will be up and tracking for sure uh, first thing in 2010 so we purchase our underlying data from a company called Cantar Media, CMAG. Um, they track in all 210 media markets in the United States, and they provide us with frequency data like this that tell you down to the second on which programs in which markets um, and uh, for about how much money each advertisement airs. So we get this massive frequency database, and then we also get content. And it used to be the case that we just got uh, storyboards along the form uh, that's here. We now actually get full video files, which enable us to do a whole so host of additional analysis. For example, you wouldn't necessarily know from this PDF that this ad is actually intended to be humorous. It talks about Toomey. Maybe he ought to run for Senate in China, and the Chinese flag then pops down behind him with a gong. So um, those kinds of analyses are now po possible with what we do. We have undergraduates across our three institutions who log on to an online coding system. They uh, add, they're automatically given to their queue and they, ask, they are asked to answer a series of objective questions about each ad. What's the sponsor of the ad? What's the tone of the ad? What are the issues that are mentioned in the ad? Um, and other, other sorts of things. And then we aggregate all of that data together and provide real-time press release updates throughout the fall. We were live for five weeks and we put out eight press releases. <laughs> um, uh, that, and, and importantly for all of you, not only do we provide a narrative, but we also provide open source tables that, that allow people at the local level even to know what's going on in their particular states or their particular races. So it allows us to t say things like there was an estimated almost $1 billion spent on federal and gubernatorial ads just between September 1st and Election Day, um, and about 2.6 million ads. That is a historic record. And interest groups were uh, involved in roughly 20% of that, so they spent about $180 million. Um, we can also tell you uh, what, who the top interest group players are, about how much they spent, um, on how many ads, and specifically and importantly for those people in local races where those ads aired um, and, and for what cost. And so as you can see here, there was a preponderance of Repu especially Republican interest groups uh, in this particular cycle. We can also break it down by, the, by who's mentioning which issues where. And we can slice the data all kinds of ways. This is showing you uh, the comparison of Democratic issue mentions to Republicans, but we can break it down by candidate ads. We can break it down by interest group ads. We can tell you how, how the balance of the campaign is being shifted by these various players for just a second. Um, and then we can tell you across the various players um, in comparison to previous data, which was our predecessor project, the Wisconsin Advertising Project has actually tracked this back from 2000. 
we can tell you how uh, interests have changed. So here you can see in the house race, interest groups, uh, their activity this cycle increased by almost 300% on the house side. Little, uh, slightly smaller increase on the Senate side, but again, um, massive increase in activity. Despite that, uh, it is definitely not the case, and this is where the historical data really comes into play. We can definitively say that uh, this was not the most historic year in terms of interest group activity. So if you look back using Wisconsin Advertising Project data, you can see that uh, the interest group activity in the House is actually less than it was in 2000, which was part of the impetus for the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act. Um, Nevertheless, we expect that activity to grow as, uh, <laughs> in the new landscape. Every cycle, uh, folks complain about this is the most negative election cycle we've ever seen. Um, it's not always true, um, but this year, to no one's surprise, I'm sure we were able to ver empirically verify that, yes, indeed, this last election cycle was the most negative on record. And here's part of the reason why. Um, interest group players are not the most negative. Actually, party-sponsored ads are the most negative. But interest groups are second, are second to that. And as interest group activity continues to increase, which we fully expect it will, campaigns are likely to get more and more negative. So if you don't like the negativity out there, it's only going to get worse as we go on. Metrics, how do we track our impact? Well, the first, our first big audience is, of course, news media, because we want to reach the, the public. We're very proud of the national media sources on um, which we got coverage, but I have to tell you that we're also very proud of the local sources, because we're able to provide, again, to local reporters and local races the extent to which uh, their things are provided. On the policy advocacy and transparency side, our goal is to be a definitive resource. So uh, Wisconsin advertising data pro prior to us was featured in the um, court challenges to the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act. We fully expect to be able to provide information to Congress should they decide to mount a legislative response to uh, Camp Citizens United. Um, we've talked with the FEC about various things. And then on the academic side, of course, our, our, our job is to also publish academic work. These are two pieces that were aimed to not just at academics, but at a wider audience. We've got lots more to come. We've, we're expanding, expanding the project to track internet ads and YouTube and all those sorts of things, and I'm happy to talk about that um, later if anybody's interested. But for right now, our main goal and our main concentration is fundraising for 2012. Again, we could fully expect interest group activity to increase with the White House at stake. There's even more at stake, and so there will be more money uh, injected into, into the campaign finance landscape. And the underlying cost of the data, again, if you have a lot of money, you can purchase it. But even national news media don't have the resources to do that. And so you're the only ones out there that are providing the open source public data. And therefore, we are profoundly grateful that uh, Folks like Knight and Sunland believe that we're important. We hope that they will continue to do so, as well as other foundations so that we can continue to provide that information. This is Kevin Curry, who is going to be talking to us about City Camp. Where's the full screen? Full screen. Uh, apologize to the Ignite gods and ask if I can just drive myself since there are only 12. Slides and I, in exchange for that, I'll give you back two minutes and be able to get to our sessions a lot faster. So my name is Kevin Curry, and I'm here to tell you about City Camp. Um, City Camp is an international uh, unconference series and online community dedicated to innovation for municipal governments and community organizations. And um, it started in uh, January of last year in uh, 2010, and people came from all over the United States. Canada, uh, the UK, and to talk about this idea of innovating around community organizations and municipal governments. So uh, stimulate, participate, collaborate, repeat. Each city camp has four goals. Bring together people like you from local governments, community organizations, civic hackers, journalists, get them in a room together and start to create a space where we can talk about this idea of uh, opening local government, uh, participating in local government, and second, is to create and maintain patterns uh, for using the web as a platform. Uh, one of the taglines of City Camp is Gov 2 goes local. And um, you know, some people uh, think that's too narrow, but really the web is an undeniable force in how we are able to connect and do all these things. I was following along Transparency Camp yesterday through the hashtag, which was great. Third goal is to foster a community of practices around this idea. And then the fourth, which is the most important thing, and you'll hear more about this hopefully this afternoon, is to create action that comes out of the camp. So just like Nicole was saying earlier, we don't want to just come together and talk and feel good about what we're doing. We want to actually do something when we leave. 
Okay, so it's a non-conference, right? There are couches. <laughs> this is the San Francisco room, uh, uh, aptly noted uh, for the bean bags of, of City Camp Chicago, uh, that we very first City Camp. Um, it started in Chicago, and uh, my co-organizer actually is Jennifer Polka from Code for America. So we spent about three months putting together this idea that really ultimately came from Transparency Camp and Gov2O Gov Camp, where we're all having this conversation about, uh, you know, open government, participatory government, open data, and it was all happening at the federal level. And there were a bunch of us who said, you know, really there's local government is where, you know, government touches our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. Why aren't we having this conversation about local? So literally sent out a tweet and said we should do a city camp. Jen took me up on it and said I'll help you organize it. And before we know, we had 100 and some odd people come to Chicago to talk about this idea. The Sunlight Foundation has uh, been a big supporter of this event from the beginning. They've actually sponsored every city camp that's happened in the United States. So um, after that first event, we told everyone, okay, we did it. You saw how we did it. Go back and do it where you live. Um, Jen was getting ready to start Code for America. I have a day job. I do all of this stuff in my volunteer time where I can steal time away from my job and my family. And we said, listen, we can't do this again. You need to go do it. And so we left uh, Chicago and said, you know, take city camp back to your cities. Well, one city did that, Washington, D.C. Uh, Washington, D.C. has a great community for this, as you all know. So the folks at iStrategy Labs and Shiny Heart uh, put together a city camp for D.C. week. But after that, it really, um, no other events were planned. And it, and it didn't fade out because the online community was really vibrant. There, people were using the city camp hashtag continually on Twitter. Um, the forum was active. And, um, and, you know, it was still there. There was still something there, but there were no events happening. Eventually, people started to write me and said, you know, can you help me do a city camp in my city? Or I want to do a city camp and I don't know what to do. And so um, I, I didn't know what to do either, really. Um, I didn't have the time to help. I didn't have the resources to help. So we came up with this idea of, of, of creating, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but it explains these numbers here, of, this, of creating this open source brand for city camps so that anybody could do it. And once we did that, city camps started happening everywhere. Uh, there have been 11 of them in cities around the world. You see here, there are two in Russia. The first international one was in the UK. It was organized by our friends uh, from FutureGov. I don't know if any of them are here today, but they did an awesome city camp in London. It was really inspiring, and a bunch of people came for that. Um, about 900 people participated in camps just last year. So the first one in January, a bunch of time went by, and um, but, but by the time the end, by the time the year was up, 900 people had participated in these things. 550, 519 members on online forums, and uh, 879 posts. Okay, so what do I mean by open source brand? Everything that has to do with City Camp is in the Creative Commons. Um, and I, don't, I probably don't have to explain to you guys why that is. The idea is so that it can spread. And, uh, you know, it, it's, we want City Camps to happen. We want people to come together and talk about innovating in their cities and in their community organizations. So. We put it in the, in the Creative Commons and uh, worked with uh, GovFresh, um, who's uh, been a big supporter of City Camp, also to create this idea of an open source brand. And so what that did was now we have a pattern that we can use and repeat and follow. And so uh, here's an example of, of five City Camp homepages, a um, couple from the UK. There's getting ready to be one coming up in Raleigh, North Carolina, San Francisco, Colorado. And they're all following this pattern. Um, th there are rules, um, some very simple rules about how you can organize a camp and what you need to do as a host. Um, but you know, the idea is to make it easy and to follow with the successes that other people are doing, just like we did with Transparency Camp, just like we did after coming out of Gov2O Camp. We said we saw that, it works, let's do it. Okay, so what I want you to do is, my action here is to try to get some of you to start a camp where you live. Um, and so I'm just going to take a couple of slides to tell you how to do that. <coughs> Here's the URL, citycamp.govfresh.com slash start a camp. Okay, so the first thing you would do is join the online community. eDemocracy Foundation hosts this online forum uh, where um, you know, people talk about city camp and the things that are important about it. There's also a team uh, site, which is for people who actually want to organize one. This is the main community. 
Uh, but if you're thinking about organizing one and you want help, there's a, there's a team for them. Um, and the second thing you can do is host a meetup. And so we, we have this meetup site that the GovLoop put together for us to organize um, just you know, meeting activities for people who want to keep it going between their events. And that's what I do. I live down in Virginia Beach, a couple hundred miles down the road, and I host meetups and people come together and we just talk about it. So we haven't had our event yet. We're doing our planning. There, there are supposed to be a three and a four in here, but I haven't finished this slide deck. It's only been a year and I'm just now getting around to a deck for this <laughs> thing. Um, so it's not unfinished, actually. It's in my teaser for, for this afternoon. If you want to find out what three and four are, please come this afternoon and we can talk about um, you know, what else you can do to host a camp. Um, and kind of a random slide here. <laughs> um, I, I'm a big fan of Delicious. I'm really excited that they just got uh, acquired by by uh, YouTube uh, founders to keep this thing going because we I use it. A lot of people use it to create catalogs of information that are important. So you know, there's like I sent this around yesterday. There are about 92 posts up here that intersect local government transparency. Um, if you go to the main route tags uh, city camp, here are all the open data catalogs that we keep track of. Here are all the ideation platforms. So every city camp uses like a user voice or a Google moderator um, to crowdsource ideas for the camp. Here's where they're all, you can find them all right here. And then here are all the camps and there's lots more good stuff out there. I think this is my last slide. I think you're out of time. So thank you very much. If you want to find out more, please come this afternoon. Thanks.